All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, thank you for joining. Uh, well, we thought we'd uh, start 2021 off with a bang. Uh, we've uh, reinvited our good friend uh, from Winnipeg, uh, Dr. Rakesh Arora. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Arora, for those of you who are not familiar. Um, is an expert uh, in many areas. Uh, officially, he holds the title as the head of the Department of Cardiac Surgery uh, at St. Boniface in Winnipeg. He's also the uh, section head for critical care. And then last but not least, uh, he um, has a lot of, I guess, for lack of a better term, sort of uh, pet areas of interest. Um, and uh, in addition to critical care and cardiac surgery, uh, he has been the previous president of the American Delirium Society. He currently uh, works actively with the uh, American Association of Thoracic Surgery and the SDS, which is Society of Thoracic Surgeons, uh, in the areas of critical care, but also now in the area of ERAS. ERAS is uh, short for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. It's an area that's obviously not specific to cardiac surgery. It's a word for all surgical specialties. But needless to say, cardiac surgery, uh, which has been always a leader in the area of data collection and, and data outcomes assessment, uh, has taken a lead on this front as well. So uh, Rakesh, along with a few others uh, from across Canada and the United States, David Engelman, for instance, Daniel Engelman, sorry, for instance, um, have really kind of taken the lead on this front. Uh, and I thought it would be, a, I, I originally was going to do this talk and I asked Rakesh for just a stock set of slides. And he said, well, would you like me to give this? And I said, well, I'm not going to turn that offer down. So it's, it's with, uh, with pleasure that I uh, introduce uh, Dr. Rakesh Aurora to talk to us really on the subject of ERAS and how it uh, can affect our practice. Rakesh? Great, thanks very much for that introduction uh, answer. Uh, I'll just share my screen here, I guess, uh, with the appropriate file, if I can figure that out, here we go. Hopefully you can see my screen adequately there. Yep, no problems. Perfect. Okay, so yes, thanks very much again for the invitation. I have these disclosures that have no specific direct interaction with this talk, other than I will talk about nutrition. And I think that that's the one area about ERAS in particular I'll focus in a bit more, mainly because it's relatively low hanging fruit and one that you can implement in any center relatively straightforward. So I do have some conflicts with Abbott Nutrition, where I served on an ad board. And for enhanced medical nutrition has provided some of the product we're using in a research initiative, looking at how to prehab in a nutrition way as an in-kind contribution for that particular study. But I won't speak to any product specifically in this particular talk. Again, let's thank Ansar uh, for giving me the invitation, the opportunity to bore you again for another 20 minutes and I'll jump right into the talk here. Uh, I do also like to acknowledge all these people who have been essential into our research program and my understanding of how to take care of older adults more comprehensively. The top three gentlemen there you see is Ken Rockwood, James Rudolph, and Alistair McCullough, uh, who are proper uh, older adult experts and geriatricians. Hashtag geriatricians are cool. Uh, if you don't know any geriatricians, you should get to know them. They're intensely helpful to your patients in both the preoperative and postoperative phases of care. Uh, in addition, Barry Campbell, Nav Tangri, Todd Mel have been research partners. Scott Keller, a former PDF of ours, is now on staff at Dalhousie. And Jonathan Alfalalo, who is really a leader for us in this area as a geriatric cardiologist, and yes, that is apparently a thing, uh, who has been really uh, at the forefront of this and has uh, led a number of important initiatives looking at frailty and improved outcomes in older adults with cardiac disease. This is perhaps the most important slide. I'll start with this in case people have to run away early. There are, this paradigm that Jim Rudolph and I came up with a few years ago really stresses the factors that we have that are important for the cardiac surgery patient. It's the so-called three strike model. We have baseline frailty or baseline vulnerability in our patients that's encapsulated not only by their cardiac disease and their age, but frailty, nutrition, psychosocial stressors, cognitive dysfunctions, and other. Then undergo the stress of surgery, either secondary to an acute event, such as an acute coronary syndrome or a recent heart failure event, the anesthetic component, open procedures versus minimally invasive, blood loss, and so forth. And then there's the factors post-operatively, the hemodynamic perturbations, lack of mobility, medications we give for pain that may impact sleep and the environments that are quite noisy in our ICUs and so forth, that lead to this three-strike paradigm that ultimately lead to worse outcomes in our patients. So if you keep this sort of model in your mind of how you approach ERAS, thinking of the preoperative, 
intraoperative and postoperative factors are the different areas that you can target um, improved uh, clinical pathway development in your patients. And so really we're talking this whole patient journey from the preoperative phase to the follow-up phase, following hospital discharge to 30 days or 90 days or one year thereafter, we need to look at in terms of the overall trajectory of your patients, not just the inter interoperative or interhospital component of their care. Okay, the last most important slide, our patients are getting older and sicker. And so what I'm gonna to provide to you is an overview of a very comprehensive plan, but focusing on just one component of that uh, in more detail today as an example of how this works. I don't want this to be a data dump and it's almost impossible to do so in 20 minutes, but I'll have you directed to these three important studies that have come out in the last few years that are impactful to how we take care of our patients, both in the pre-op operative, as well as the intraoperative and ICU phases. The top one are the one I'll speak, spend the most time on today is the guidelines that we put out as part of the ERAS Society for Cardiac Surgery, looking at the perioperative care uh, in a 22 point step plan. Okay, very briefly, I'll go through a, a case example of the type of patient we're talking about, why this is important or why this may have happened to this patient, what data is out there, and how to actually implement, uh, again, a component of the ERAS protocol. Okay, so let's start with an 80-year-old person who's come in initially for colorectal surgery, is found to have a murmur on physical exam. Subsequent workup shows that he has some degree of heart failure that's been progressive over the last several months. And then echocardiogram and cath shows he's got critical aortic stenosis and three vessel coronary artery disease. He's referred to you as a cardiac surgeon. You do the appropriate evaluation. So yes, he's got surgical disease and the plan is to go ahead with the cardiac procedure prior to his having a colectomy requires for his bowel cancer. He comes in through your pre-admission clinic and is being seen by your team there. And whilst he's in the clinic, he's given the usual examination and asked, why is he there in clinic? He goes, I don't know, I'm here probably for something for my heart. I'm getting a heart checkup. So denoting some degree of perhaps cognitive issues and not really being aware of what this actual indication for coming to see you is. If you were to plug this person's risk score into any number of risk scores, we use the Euroscore too here, but it could be the SDS score as well, based on the information that I've given you so far and what, what have come up as part of evaluation, this person would be deemed to be a relatively low risk patient in terms of the operative mortality being less than 3% when you plug in all the various factors in this particular scoring system. Unfortunately, this patient undergoes his procedure, but then has a difficult course postoperatively. So it's a biprostatic aortic valve done through a traditional hemisternotomy and a cabbage times four. But he wakes up in your eyes too, and he's thrashing wildly, despite the provision of appropriate what you think is narcotics for pain, as well as getting dexmedetomidine to help smooth the emergence from delirium. You put him back to sleep with some propofol. He goes for an urgent CT scan. It doesn't show anything acute. Uh, he comes back to the ICU after a CT scan. Unfortunately, he extubates himself, but is able to maintain some SADs, but still thrashing wildly on bed. So he gets the usual cocktail of some, some benzodiazepines, some more narcotics, then gets a lot of Haldol. And now he's no longer thrashing, quite sleepy. Then he gets very hypoxic. And unfortunately, he's now aspirated and has, gets reintubated in your ICU and has a very difficult course or afterwards with a couple of rounds of intubation, extubation, gets a tracheostomy, a VAP, kidney injury, and has a long stay in the hospital. When it's time to, for him to go home, it turns out he lives alone and doesn't have great social support, so he gets admitted to a long-term care facility. This outcome we've, term, we've termed a few years ago as poor functional survival. To be honest, we kind of made up this term, but we published it four times, so I guess it counts as a real term. And what poor functional survival indicates is someone who is either expired or died during their operation or get admitted to a long-term care facility somewhere other than home. The converse would be someone with good functional survival would be someone who is alive and in their own home, at least at some level. So I guess in this particular case, a gentleman came in with an elective procedure, essentially, we could say we didn't really win in this person who should have had hopefully a much more smoother course than what he experienced. So there are a number of steps when you look through this case in, in retrospect, where there are points of vulnerability. He had two different diagnoses, so there was certainly some comorbidity associated with it. He had some degree of complex cardiac disease that was progressive for a number of months with heart failure that led to uh, increased frailty and vulnerability, which I understand you've had a great talk recently from Greg Hirsch, as well as in some cognitive difficulties that pulled out in the clinic preoperatively. 
In addition, then he had a difficult course postoperatively with delirium, got a number of medications to, to help with that, unfortunately led to further complications. So about three, four years ago, we a few of us banded together to think, well, there must be a better way to do that. And that was really the origin of the ERACS Society. We called ourselves ERACS initially for the enhanced recovery after cardiac surgery. However, the ERAS Society, which is out of uh, the Europe, quickly lawyered up and said, no, you can't call yourselves that. So we ended up partnering with them and became the ERAS Cardiac Surgery, which is a much longer name, but nonetheless serves the same purpose. Uh, so our executive board is here, as well as a number of advisory board members from interdisciplinary care, uh, both in Canada and the US, have formed an um, uh, initial panel, then a guidelines panel to develop a larger comprehensive plan for perioperative care. That's again highlighted for you in this particular document and listed in sort of a preoperative, intraoperative, postoperative components that you can see here that looks relatively comprehensive. And for us mere mortals uh, who don't have unlimited funds to develop a comprehensive team to enact this seems quite daunting and perhaps overwhelming. But it really looks at preoperative optimization in terms of smoking sensation, nutrition optimization, using the appropriate multimodal analgesia, preventing postoperative nausea, vomiting, and sedation, and then early extubation, enhancement of bowel and diet regime, mobilization, and then appropriate planning for discharge. So when you look at this long list, it looks to be almost something that'd be impossible for us to enact. But in essence, it's built on the theory of uh, aggregate marginal gains. Each little bit of itself is additive to the previous one and leads to a greater sum of overall. And there are many things within this protocol that you're likely doing very well already. Some are opportunities for refinement. Some may be some new ones that you don't currently do. So when scaling this back to cardiac surgery, again, I'll focus on one example where cardiac surgery has evolved quite markedly that you're likely doing your center very well. And that's with regards to early extubation. When you look at traditional cardiac surgery in the, in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and perhaps even the 80s, the way we did anesthetics, the way we provided cardiopulmonary bypass was very different, where people had prolonged uh, intubations, post-procedures. The use of tracheostomy was much more routine. We used higher dose narcotics leading to high rates of delirium and poor mobility. We encouraged long periods of rest after MIs and then after surgery. And overall, the strategy we used weren't really geared towards getting people out of hospital in a rapid fashion. Obviously now we do have early extubation pathways. I Googled super fast, so this cat has nothing to do with this talk. I just saw it when I Googled super fast and it made me laugh, so I included my talk. But it's, it's really, we're talking about fast track anesthesia here. Most centers now are participating in some degree of fast track where you're extubating people within 12 or certainly less than six hours. Some centers now moving even further upstream trying to extubate in the OR or something called ultra fast track. Ricky uh, Moran Muller, our resident, has looked at our 20 year data looking at OR extubation in terms that it's safe and we can get about 40 to 60% of our patients successfully intubated or extubated in the operating room uh, with, uh, without any significant compromise to their safety or need for reintubation. So that's an example of showing how we have as a specialty evolved in one area of care of prolonged intubation, early extubation to now doing OR extubation like one would do for a gallbladder operation. So again, a lot of what we focus in cardiac surgery and more, particularly in my career uh, up until a few years ago was the post-operative care, both in the ICU and the ward. More recently, we've really tried to focus on the pre-operative component to know how we can set the stage for vulnerable patients, perhaps to go through a, a surgery more successfully. And I'm going to focus on this component a bit more deliberately. So as you would have heard from uh, Greg's talk a little while ago, a number of our patients could be deemed frail, and frail is an umbrella term for the biopsychosocial, cognitive, and physical components uh, that are associated with vulnerability of patients. When you look for frailty in our patients with any number of tools that are out there, approximately half of our patients could be deemed frail, and this is associated with worse functional survival and negative outcomes such as delirium and so forth postoperatively. When you break down the components of frailty, however, the ones that seem to be most predictive of negative outcomes are those associated with sarcopenia, a loss of muscle, weight loss, weak grip strength, and so forth. This therefore is potentially a targetable solution for patients where we can look to optimize patients in the preoperative phase, as well as through their whole surgical journey to ensure that they don't further deteriorate in this particular regard. 
This led to this concept of this new prehabilitation of both exercise paired with nutrition and mental health counseling and alleviation of stress and mindfulness in the perioperative phase. Again, I'm focused on one component of this, but I'm happy to talk about any of this in the question period to follow. What we're really hoping to do is to refill someone's fuel tank. So when you look at this, this fulcrum of frailty versus resilience, frailty is really the vulnerability to stress where resilience is the yin to that yang, where it's really someone's ability to bounce back from that stress once it's experienced. If you look at the purple bar in this care, the majority of patients who are frail who undergo the standard of care as we currently do at most centers in cardiac surgery, including ours until a few years ago, there will be a predictable drop in overall function that may below, cross this functional capacity threshold where there's some degree of, of vulnerability to go to a frail state in the perioperative phase. Depending how deep that curve is or how where they started on, the, on this overall spectrum, of this con continuum of frailty, they may never get back to their functional baseline. Versus those patients, what we hope to achieve with a new prehab-like protocol is to refill their fuel tank to a higher level to a pre-fail, even better level preoperatively. When they undergo that predictable drop post-op, they can rebound back up to a reasonable baseline or even perhaps better once their cardiac disease has been corrected. So is there any evidence to show that doing any prehab is actually a benefit? There's some, but not a lot. And there's some ongoing studies that we've participated in and you guys have participated in the past looking at the effect of prehabilitation as it pertains to exercise in the preoperative phase in patients with uncorrected cardiac disease. Based on the data out there so far in our guidelines that you'll hopefully have a chance to read, this was given a class 2A recommendation based on the relatively low data, but we felt that overall based on trials are out there, it's a reasonable thing to consider uh, in your patients with the appropriate supervision and monitoring. I won't focus on the physical component much today again, but I'll focus on the next part, which is really needs to be paired with the physical component, which is adequate nutrition. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of malnutrition and carb loading as a way to start, a simple way to start a, a, pre, um, a prehab and ERAS component in your particular center. Why is this important? When you look at the pathophysiology of frailty or vulnerability in your patients, again, focusing on the sarcopenia component shown for you here on the right side of your screen, you can see it becomes a vicious cycle of things that perpetuates itself. This is in part driven by chronic undernutrition or malnutrition. And while there are some patients who clearly be very thin and cachectic, that'll be obvious, the majority of patients' malnutrition is relatively difficult to discern from the outside. This is usually characterized by some degree of unintentional, inadequate micronutrient or macronutrient deficiencies, be it protein or other micro micronutrients that perpetuates the cycle of negative energy balance, loss of muscle, less strength and power, less physical activity, therefore less energy expenditure, resulting in less food intake and so forth and going around and around in the cycle that's further compounded by the cardiac disease they have that adds to the sarcopenia due to the limitations from their um, uh, symptoms from their cardiac disease. So how common in this? Well, in the, in the study of older adults being hospitalized uh, in any uh, specialty, about 40% of patients can be considered malnourished or chronically undernourished. In cardiac surgery, again, if you look for it using any number of one of screening tools, about 20% or one in five of our patients could be considered malnourished. And this further compounds any degree of frailty or cognitive difficulties they may have. Again, why does this matter? In many of our patients, and again, for example, in this patient, those patients with uh, chronic heart failure are more susceptible to having this. Those with obvious cardiac cachectia or sarcopenia, those with some degree of anemia or chronic disease are more likely to have this happen to them as well. This results in worse functional recovery, higher rates of infection, longer hospital and ICU length of stay, and higher rates of mortality. So, what do you do about this? Well, it would appear that there's not a lot of data for this in cardiac surgery either. So we have to extrapolate a little bit from non-cardiac surgery and looking at colorectal patients. The nice part, or not the nice part, but the benefit of having uh, identified malnutrition in your patient is that it's, it's ripe for intervention and it doesn't take a lot of time. But providing protein supplementation of about 25 to 50 grams more per day or about 1.5 milligrams per kilogram 
per day of additional supplementary protein support for a minimum seven, but probably ideally 10 days or more is often a benefit to provide a, in, improvements with regards to infections, complications, as well as a hospital length of stay. Again, this is from colorectal patients. So we have to extrapolate a little bit to the cardiac surgery patient. Again, we gave this a class 2A recommendation based on limited data that's out there. Perhaps a bit more straightforward that's become the industry standard in most non-cardiac surgery um, uh, uh, surgical population is the use of a complex uh, carbohydrate load preoperatively. And this really tackles the paradigm that we've all behold ourselves of being MPO at midnight until after their surgery. Uh, what has been um, sussed out in non-cardiac surgery in a much more deliberate way is the use of, of not restricting uh, food for a much shorter period of time preoperatively, so eight hours, eating up to eight hours uh, prior to your surgery. And in fact, giving then a complex carbohydrate load solution of about 50 grams of, of uh, a complex carbohydrate that's very rich in maltodextrins, ideally up to two hours prior to surgery uh, is been now advocated as being appropriate to help refuel the fuel tank prior to going to surgery. For cardiac surgery, because there's a risk or concern about the use of transesophageal echo and higher rates of patients with diabetes that may have gastric outlet, emptying issues that we've extended this from two to four hours, depending on the comfort and the potential risk of your patient. Again, this was given a class 2B recommendation with the evidence being limited to some degree. So why does this work? Well, it does, it, I mean, it seems to be counterintuitive giving uh, a patient with diabetes or glycemic control issues sugar, but in fact, when you use the appropriate type of sugar mix, it actually improves insulin resistance, improves postoperative glucose concentration, and actually enhances return of function of GI function postoperatively, including postop nausea, vomiting, and other GI complications. So again, encouraging to use this as probably the simplest way to start an ERAS program at a center is encouraging or providing a, a, a car complex carbohydrate solution to your patients the night before to be given on the day of surgery on the way to hospital. So that's all lovely. You could say, well, is there any data to support this? Well, there again, we're evolving. So this is from Judson Williams from Wake Medical and, and Raleigh, North Carolina. There's a similar study from Michael Grant's group at Johns Hopkins now as well, looking at this in about 900 patients. And so again, focusing in the overall program, there was significant improvements in hospital and ICU link this day, but looking again specifically at the use of nutrition as part of an overall comprehensive uh, pathway that was a significant reduction in GI complications through the post-operative phase, again, which includes the things like GI bleed, uh, infection, and post-operative nausea and vomiting. I'm going to switch gears just slightly just for a moment before I wrap things up. I want to talk about preoperative opioid um, uh, prescription as well. I think this is a really important topic as part of an ERAS pathway for all of our patients when you think of the significant increase in awareness we've learned about opioid overdose deaths in postoperative patients. There is a significant number of overprescribing and postoperative narcotics when people are going home that's likely contributing to this opioid crisis we're seeing in North America. Um, so again, as part of our, our, our guidelines, we recommended a perioperative multimodal opioid sparing paid management strategy should be encouraged and used in your center. And again, I'd advocate even going up one step further, and this starts in the preoperative phase by understanding, by negotiating with your patient of setting up a pain management plan up front uh, and determining what their pain thresholds are and providing the appropriate overview of what to expect in the post-operative phase uh, is important. We gave this a class one recommendation as well. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap things up. We really need to evolve from being the intraoperative and perioperative specialists in the ICU to being looking at the whole surgical journey that we have to evolve the way we think of patients and what's uh, of value to them. In our opinion, I, and I, this is a term that I I've advocated for quite strongly, as much as TAVR procedures have been disruptive to cardiac surgery, I think ERAS can be equally so. The amount of gains we can get by optimization, both preoperative intraoperative and postoperative can lead to significant gains in the overall trajectory, patient quality of life, and return to active living postoperatively in our patients. We need to look at this comprehensive plan and not as a barrier, which it absolutely can be without some degree of coordination and can be deemed as being overwhelming, as an opportunity to pick and choose what we do well, start with those early wins, and build upon those to a more comprehensive plan. 
Uh, lastly, this is a shameless plug for our societies. We're doing our first virtual meeting uh, in March. Uh, you have two days left to get the early bird registration. This can be two days of a comprehensive overview of all the elements I've talked about in much more detail uh, over two days where you can get a number of CEUs for a relatively low cost and the, the link for the uh, registrations for you at the bottom there. With there, I'll stop and I'll, I'll, I'll take any questions you may have at this point in time. Thanks very much for the opportunity to present to your group again. Thanks, Rakesh. That's, that was excellent. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing, although I do want people to see the screen. Right. Um, you know what, let's just, uh, we'll stop sharing this so they can see your face. So, sure. so first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, people may or may not realize, but it is six o'clock your time and you've taken the time out of your day or from your sleep to kind of talk to us. So right. very much appreciated. Um, I would encourage anybody to use the chat function or otherwise, if they have any questions, I would just start off by this. Obviously the ERAS program is a very comprehensive program. And I, I think you're absolutely right. We're so lined, we're so lined up with the intraoperative and the post-operative phase. And to an extent, we're starting to get a little bit more involved with preoperative, but really more from risk assessment, not from, not from the standpoint of actually, you know, kind of gauging all of these other factors. How have you been, or how have others been successful in rolling this out? Uh, I, I've heard through the grapevine as of yesterday that ROR is looking into hiring an ERAS nurse. Wow, um, that's great. And I mean, it, it, not specific to cardiac surgery, but I mean, I, I feel like this is, has to be where we, we go in order to kind of make this uh, successful. And then JF, I'll, I'll open it to you afterwards. Yeah, so your ERAS team is really important. So we had um, a triad of myself, a nurse, and then another allied health specialist, a physiotherapist that really formed the basis of this. When we started, um, we had done some things very well. We've been in the delirium space and frailty space for a while. Uh, with Hillary Grocott at our center, there was a real push for the multimodal opioids, but there's all those other bits and bobs that we hadn't really figured out. So we started with a small group, went to a bigger group, with different task forces to send people off to develop their components. And um, it all fell apart because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So we rejigged this um, uh, slightly differently. And so the way we've targeted now how we're going to start is we actually asked the patients, which sounds heretical, but nonetheless, we developed a patient engagement panel we did virtually and went through a Delphi-like process with them to help prioritize what they felt were the most important components. And that's where we focused on nutrition first, because I said that was important for us. We know, want to know what, how to eat better post preoperative and postoperative. And that's what we started. The ideal state would be have a patient navigator, such an ERAS coordinator, which it sounds like what you're getting, which is phenomenal. We've not had that buy-in uh, from our, our site as of yet. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Rakesh. Uh, my question is really more around uh, how do we prepare ourselves? Obviously, implementation and, and being aware and talking about it is helpful, but how do we measure ourselves in terms of our performance? Like if yeah. you were to give us the three outcomes that we should over time measure to see if we have an impact, wh what would you recommend us to focus on? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we just actually published a paper on this for that specific reason of what the quality metrics should be. And I'm happy to provide that to you. But in, in great, in, 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 in simple terms, you want to provide a metric that's patient value centric um, and two, that is easily trackable. So it's not additive to your workload overall. So the simple things can be, again, we pick the preoperative carbohydrate um, load as a simple way to start. It's pretty easy to identify. It's pretty easy to track whether they take it and taking it or not and use that as a quality metric that yes, they did receive or didn't receive and using that to springboard to other things as you go along. Uh, for example, was this screening tool done? Was this particular intervention done? Did this patient get multimodal analgesia, et cetera? And the last one, for example, is you can track uh, more, uh, milligrams of morphine equivalents or MMEs for the opioid one. Uh, and there's apps we're developing to help you with that as well to track that because it's really hard to calculate depending how you do it because I'm not a mathematician and it often takes a fair bit of buy-in from the pharmacist. But if you can take simple things and track that all through the patient journey and then audit your results on the back end, as you say, data is king and you won't know you're improving until you, unless you look for it. So you have to find ways to track it. That's relatively straightforward for your group. Perfect. Does that, well, does you know that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's great. 
Well, you know what, this is clearly an area of, uh, of, of, of great interest. And I think, uh, you know, your leadership in this, in this field has been, you know, super helpful, not only to, uh, to us, but I'm sure a whole lot of other people as we take this on. Uh, I see this being a project, uh, JF, for us to sort of start tackling in 2021 as we move forward, um, how we find more bandwidth to kind of take this on. We'll figure that part out. Uh, but I think it's definitely something that we need to take into consideration. Uh, Rakesh, uh, grateful for your time and for your expertise. And um, thank you so much. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll catch up soon. Great. Thanks very much, guys. Thank Cheers. You, Rakesh. Be safe thank out you. there. Thank yes. you. All right. Bye-bye.